Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to today's masterclass on mindfulness and stress management for the healthcare professional. I, as you're all kind of joining and entering the room, uh, go into the chat thread and just um, post your name and your profession and where you're from. I already see some of you are doing that. As usual with most of our webinars and masterclasses, we have a uh, a global community of, of professionals, lots of PTs and OTs and mental health providers. And of course, there's always someone with pain or other health care, can, other condition joining us. You're welcome to um, stay and learn from us. This is primarily a webinar for healthcare professionals. Professor Annette Wilgins is going to be sharing some amazing information about mindfulness in a couple of minutes. And I just want to kind of share her uh, bio with you before we begin. So Professor Wilgins is a clinical associate professor at the Doctor of Physical Therapy program at Temple University. She has over 30 years of experience in both clinical practice as well as educating uh, students and professionals. Her scholarly agenda, which is what makes me so excited, includes studying mindfulness and how it relates to resilience and stress management. And why I love Professor Wilgen's work so much is because She's working from the inside. She's working inside a, you know, active DPT program to educate future DPTs, future physical therapists, and oftentimes other health professionals that um, she works with on an interprofessional basis in the university setting. So as we know, mindfulness is is important for lots of different um, physical as well as mental health conditions, currently not being taught so much in PT school. So we're so excited to um, share this information with you. I'm just personally excited to share Annette with you. I love her and I love her work. She's going to have lots of great tools and techniques and tips that you'll learn from her um, today. If you're on this webinar, just make sure that your mic is muted so there's no interruption so we can hear Professor Wilgins um, in her entirety. And with that, I'm going to turn it over and we'll begin today's webinar. Thanks, Joe. I'm just going to share my screen here. One moment, what a warm welcome. This is wonderful. So thanks everybody for being here and thanks Joe, uh, likewise. So just wanted to open a little bit with um, my own personal journey as a, you know, um, a student myself. So I always tell my students that I don't necessarily know any more than you. I'm on this, this same journey. Uh, I've just practiced a little bit longer. So people ask me, how did I come across this work? I'm a a pediatric physical therapist. Um, I'm in academia. And um, it's an interesting story because I had taken a, a position as a brand new faculty member. And I was assistant faculty. I was the director of clinical education. And I thought, how hard can this be? I get to play students. I get to really, you know, connect them from classroom to clinic and be that bridge, be that link. I get to watch them grow. Well, it wasn't like that at all. My office became this revolving door of students with anxiety and depression and eating disorders and parents divorcing and essentially students really experiencing pain and stress. And at the same time, I had noticed a few students each year in a cohort of, you know, 60, 70, 100 students, several had, uh, would fail a clinical course. And these were really bright, really wonderful students. So I thought, hmm, what is, what is going on? And it was a, a stressor for me. It was a stressor for the rest of the faculty. It was certainly a stressor for the clinical setting. And it was, it was really significant for the student. So my dissertation topic at the time, I was completing my doctoral work and I did a study on failure in clinical education. And that was my first publication. And I learned basically that students, generally speaking, fall into two very large bins. One is the bin of um, the student that has sort of this trait emotionality, worry, rumination, anxiety, difficulty with confidence, and maladaptive perfectionism. And then that student would sort of unravel because they never got enough feedback, which of course wasn't true. They just had this um, kind of this abyss of needing 
to be constantly validated um, in the clinic. The other type of student that that really struggled was really kind of a, a baseline mindlessness. So the student that had practiced very well, kind of shoving down any emotion, any discomfort, essentially hitting the delete button on emotion, any feelings, any worries, any thoughts, so that when a, a situation arose, they would continue to delete and push away rather than address, be present and engage. So the remediation for these students became developing a program in mindfulness. So I got trained at the University of California Medical School in a mindfulness teacher training. Uh, So that's a little bit about my journey. So one of the most important things that I teach students and I I teach other faculty members across the university uh, are about the three axes of the body and that these three axes have an effect on uh, health uh, and wellness and actually mortality. So we have these three conversations going, one between the brain and the gut or the digestive system, another between a conversation with our uh, inflammatory biomarkers or cortisol, and then another conversation with the amygdala, the fight, flight, fear center of the brain. In the first stress axis, we call that the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and that is kind of uh, broken into two parts. So we have the part that is this normal uh, neuroadaptive, neurobiological response. It prepares for and provides for fear-based reaction. Bear in the room, run. There's also this maladaptive uh, response that's developed and that's called the allostatic load. And it is uh, a response in which cortisol quite literally dumps into every cell of our body. It is uh, valenced through the right prefrontal cortex. And that's kind of the unhappiness center. I call that caveman brain or, or cave woman brain sitting on the side of the road, scanning for threat, waiting for something bad to happen. And this is this ongoing kind of low threshold, damaging stress reactivity. The the second axis is the gut brain. And this is um, rather new. It's it's about 10, 15, maybe 20 years old, but it's really hot in the literature right now. It consists of a bi-directional communication between the enteric nervous system or the GI system and the endocrine system, immune system, and the autonomic nervous system, quite literally linking emotional and cognitive centers of the brain. So the gut has over 70% of the body's microbes. It has the surface area of a tennis court and it requires balance. So the microbial metabolites such as lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, and the other bacilli cause, produce gamma amino butyric acid or GABA. This is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And the other is serotonin. Serotonin we know is the happiness hormone. It prevents depression. And that's also produced by cells in the gut. And then the last sort of element of the gut brain axis is the vagus nerve, the great wandering nerve, the cranial nerve. It connects the gut quite literally to the heart, lungs, and brain. It controls the hypothalamus, limbic systems. And current research is indicating that this dysbiotic gut leads to anxiety, depression, even um, indicators for Parkinson's disease, autism, and many other chronic conditions. And then the third axis of the body was written um, as part of a study by Ahmed Tawakal out of UMass and his colleagues uh, in The Lancet 2017. And this was a study um, that coined uh, a term I use as the neural arterial hematopoietic axis. And basically what uh, Tawakal and colleagues found was proof for the mind-body connection. They had about 300 patients without cardiovascular disease or any active cancers. They studied them longitudinally for years. They looked at amygdala activity, bone marrow activity, and arterial inflammation, including C-reactive protein and markers of perceived stress. Based on illumination on a functional MRI scan of the amygdala, perceived stress, they could robustly 
and consistently predict increase in bone marrow or hematopoiesis in the bone marrow, that blood producing negative loop between uh, bone marrow and, and healthy tissue and arterial inflammation. So all of these three things linked. So the first study really to link what we think or amygdalar activity in the brain to subsequent cardiovascular disease. So I found that study absolutely fascinating and really was, was confirming for me for this, um, this work and made me even more passionate about uh, teaching it to my patients, to other faculty, my friends, uh, and certainly my students. So I often get the question, why is it important that healthcare practitioners have evidence-based strategies for patient care? So it's in, important in this area that we, we understand the impact of mindful practices in terms of quality of care. We know from work out of the University of Rochester and Nick Krasner's group that the patient safety improves, but there is less medical error when we practice mindful medicine, and there are less intervention errors. In terms of clinician well-being, there's lower burnout less compassion fatigue, and increased overall well-being. And there's this quality of caring uh, that causes patient satisfaction scores to go high and adherence to prescribed meds, exercise, and any other provider recommendations. So overall, it's, it's really no longer appropriate for us as clinicians to treat the symptoms or parts of the human being. We can have a significant role in healing and altering the patient's course in terms of their feelings of isolation, dis-ease, and that negativity bias. So I teach my patients and my students three main things. First of all, the evidence is strong about our ability to continue to be neuroplastic over the course of the lifespan. So what we practice grows stronger. If we practice fear-based thinking, shame, um, sadness, those circuits get stronger. If we practice trust and empathy and self-care and self-love, all of those circuits get stronger as well. The second is, along with that concept of neuroplasticity, what we don't acknowledge grows stronger. So we need to know our triggers. It's kind of like, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. We all have that shadow side in our brain and we need to know what uh, the language or the communication of that shadow side is. And we can talk to our patients very openly about that and use ourselves as a good example. I tell my students all the time, uh, what, what is the story going on in my mind as I try to do X, Y, and Z in my professional life? The story is of self-doubt, of um, unworthiness, and, and that kind of fuels uh, that negative loop. And that's my shadow side. That's what I'm always kind of working against. Another concept that I think is critical is what we silence causes shame and isolation. And that's based on Brene's Brown, Brene Brown's work and her research. And um, it's very strong in the literature in terms of this a fear of being our, our authentic selves and saying, yes, I'm struggling right now. So I tell all of my students, you know, when I ask you how you are, I don't want you to tell me fine, because that doesn't mean anything to me. I want you to be truthful. And I often tell them, and I tell my patients, what's your number today? Uh, so on a scale of one to 10, one means I want to crawl back in bed and pull the covers over my head and not come out for a week. 10 means I'm living a strength-based life. I'm making good decisions based on wisdom and knowledge of both my triggers and my strengths. And I, I think that the third big one is that um, in terms of our patients, we can no longer provide interventions. You know, whether in you, you're in the acute care setting, the, the orthopedic setting, uh, the pediatric setting, that just address mobility and healing. Uh, to truly heal, we need to start with the nervous system. So we can use the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system uh, to get that in balance first so that the intervention can stick, so that it can be accepted by the body. It can be integrated and become the new familiar. 
Because the current familiar, the current way of being in our patients and students and individuals we, we meet in our daily lives is that hypervigilance and reactivity. And we're always kind of worried about what's the next thing. Am I ready? And I think that can uh, create this, um, this way of being in our patients that prevent our interventions from really landing. In terms of uh, the uh, research focus, so mindfulness journal articles, this is um, an example from um, the American Mindfulness Research Association. It's called amra.org. And it basically looks at the, the research on a monthly basis and is uh, a great resource. So this is 1980 to 2019. And you can see the number of articles that, you know, the research is just exploding uh, in terms of how we um, use mindfulness. What are the mechanisms of mindfulness? What is the neural correlates of mindfulness? What does it mean for pain? What does it mean for um, the array of chronic diagnoses that we see in the clinic? My own research focus, uh, as I said, has been largely on students and how students uh, address stress, perceive stress, and then what it means for them in the clinical setting. So yes, I like to talk about and expose the messy emotions. Again, it's about bringing um, what we prefer to shame into the light. And when we do that, it empowers students to improve their own confidence and resilience because they learn that everybody has these very same emotions. So my first study was that failure study that I uh, uh, already told you about. My second study was about the DPT curriculum. It was a movement to say, please, let's add this to the curriculum as we teach the new wave of the millennial student who's even harder on themselves, who practice this maladaptive perfectionism even more and who are even more isolated in a world of Zoom meetings and pandemic and um, all these other factors, social media that can be quite damaging. So that study was um, essentially uh, a way to uh, uncover what it is we need to teach and how we need to teach it. So concepts like chronic sorrow in our patients that have neurological disabilities, in our caregivers that care for those patients? What is ambiguous loss? What is cognitive versus emotional empathy? What is resilience? What are the maladaptive strategies? What are adaptive coping strategies? This is all currently not discussed in PT education, not even so much in OT education or PA education. It's really growing a bit more in physician education. But we basically need to normalize the entire array of human emotion and make space for how people really feel. My third study was uh, about the perception of physical therapists. So these were, I essentially took a handful of students and I said, go to your clinical and teach your clinical instructor about mindfulness. So it, there, it was a variety of settings and the students would sit down with their clinical instructor each week and essentially teach them something about mindfulness theory and practice. So this is what mindfulness is. This is what it looks like in the brain. Uh, this is how it looks in, in a clinical setting. This is how uh, you can meditate. This is what a body scan is. This is what it means to pause. These are the four pillars of mindfulness. So we learned some themes from that study that were really interesting. The first is that the physical therapists um, and healthcare providers in the study realized a need to fix the, their relationship with stress. It had gotten out of control. The second was that pausing is very difficult. They didn't like to pause. They didn't like to notice difficult thoughts. They didn't like to be uncomfortable necessarily. And the big takeaway there was really that don't believe everything you think and tune in on a regular basis. And that is the work. The third of four themes was that mindfulness works. They, at the end of 12 weeks with these students, 
had a desire to continue to practice and wanted some more tangible strategies and actually went on to download some apps that they were still using on a regular basis uh, at the end of that student clinical. And then the last was that they preferred to practice in groups, that they really wanted uh, the sense of community. Uh, So they liked the conversations, they liked to um, meditate with others and like to have group discussion on their experiences afterwards. And then this last one was my most recent study. And basically I created a mindfulness workshop for health science graduate students in the College of uh, Nursing and Health Professions. They, all of these students took pre and post tests on their perceived stress, anxiety, and tolerance of uncertainty and mindfulness, of course. After a, an MBSR-like workshop, so teaching students about meditation, how to do body scans, how to walk mindfully, how to talk mindfully, how to wash dishes mindfully. I did the post tests after that. And the cohort improved in all of the markers across the board. That was cool. But what was most interesting was that they maintained the outcomes nine months later without any intervention in between and benefited from the, uh, the training during a clinical course. So they felt more grounded. They felt more confident. They felt more skilled in their ability to communicate with their clinical instructors. And they felt more um, peacefulness and wellness overall. So that was really wonderful for me. In terms of burnout and compassion fatigue, I hear this a lot from even my new graduates. There's a study um, in the Journal of Physical Therapy Education that showed that over the course of the three years of DPT education, uh, students decreased in scores of empathy. So it makes sense that upon graduation in the first five years, students would struggle with empathy, burnout, and compassion fatigue. And I think that this is a problem across the board in young clinicians and new grads and our seasoned clinicians. Burnout and compassion fatigue defined as first burnout, work dissatisfaction, lack of motivation, low energy, a physical and emotional exhaustion overall in response to stress. Compassion fatigue is a bit more slow onset, a bit more tricky to acknowledge. It's an overall life dissatisfaction, a feeling of helplessness, hopelessness, a feeling that potentially one feels a bit out of control, a bit of PTSD, caring too much or emotional contagion from our uh, patients and clients. It shows up as, as poor sleep, Uh, digestive troubles, emotional flooding, and a difficulty with that objectivity that we need as clinicians. Both essentially show up in the brain as depersonalization, seen here in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and somatic sensory regions, as well as smaller regions of the brain, such as the hippocampus, um, the area of the brain responsible for learning and memory, and areas associated with emotion regulation. Emotional exhaustion also seen here as reduced blood flow uh, in the especially frontal, cingulate and parietal regions. So mindfulness is this mediating factor between stress and burnout and compassion fatigue. In fact, a systematic review of healthcare professionals indicated that mindfulness acts on three systems attention control, emotion regulation, and self-awareness. But the key underlying ingredient that most people find the most difficult and resist because it feels unfamiliar is self-compassion. It feels indulgent. It feels wrong. It's not how we were raised. And they worry that any self-compassion will prevent them from being productive It'll take me off my game. The study indicated that this is absolutely not true. The more the uh, individuals in the study practiced self-compassion, the better their productivity became and the less they experienced depression, anxiety, uh, and fear avoidance. 
And then the last thing is I, I get the question all the time about what's wrong with mind wandering. So in terms of um, burnout, compassion, fatigue, and this concept of mind wandering, the research is pretty clear. It teaches us that a mind wandering brain is a negative brain and contributes to this um, default mode or familiar kind of way of being in the brain. The burnout and compassion fatigue ensue pretty rapidly after that. In terms of mindfulness practice, that's a very different neural circuit in the brain. These are lateralized structures like the somatosensory cortex that is activated. And the key really is that we can't have both neural circuits in the brain work simultaneously. The mindfulness circuit shuts down the mind wandering circuit and the default circuit. The default circuit and that mind wandering stressed, burnt out, compassion, fatigued brain shuts down the mindfulness circuit. So in terms of training the mind, when we sit to meditate for even five minutes, the research tells us that eight minutes is that golden number where the research really starts to indicate significance. When we do that, it sets us up for strengthened neural connections during the day when under cognitive load or stress, we can much more easily connect to the mindful circuits and disconnect from the mind wandering circuits, those circuits that contribute to the burnout and compassion fatigue. So I found that fascinating. Uh, that's uh, research from Zayden and Vago out of the New York Academy of Sciences. Another concept that is really exploding in the literature is the um, effects of trauma on health. And this uh, has um, strong connections to mindfulness theory and practice. You may or may not have heard of the ACE study. ACE study stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, which was a study done in the 1990s by a man named Felitti and colleagues. It was done in Southern California, and it was a huge study with the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. Essentially, they looked at thousands, I think almost 20,000 people who were employed, they had health care, they were college educated, and they had health insurance, as I said. So they looked at the ACE scores. So essentially, uh, ACE scores are categorized into three main groups. Childhood abuse between the age of birth and 18 childhood neglect, and household dysfunction. Within those categories, there are subcategories. And overall, there are 10 items. For every item, the individual would assign themselves a point. So this original ACE study, 25% of them had at least one ACE, and almost 60% of them had 30 to 40% ACEs. One out of six had four or more ACEs. So when you think about some of our underserved areas, um, our impoverished areas, we think about how many ACE scores they might have. And then we think about our patients and clients and what resources they might have. You think about some of these adverse childhood experiences and the research is strong. It, it leads to chronic disease, infectious diseases, and mental health and illness. So there's a recent TED talk that was um, done by Nadine Burke Harris. She was a pediatrician in one of the most underserved areas of um, Sacramento, California. And she clearly states it in a way that I'd like to share with you here. She says that ACEs are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. And she goes on to say, we'd rather not look at it. We'd rather be sick. Her study and studies in the last five years have found that four or more ACEs give you a 400% chance as compared to others of getting COPD, 13 times more chance of taking your life, five to 10 times more of a chance of having a diagnosis of anxiety and depression, you get the idea. So when we look at our patients and we see them through a trauma-informed lens, 
And by that, I mean, not so much what's wrong with you, but what's, what's happened to you, or even better, as John Kabat-Zinn, the, the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction says, there's more right with you than wrong with you. When we approach patients in this way, we can really begin to change the story of this trajectory and add to resilience factors and coping strategies. So it's all connected and it is um, a real shift in the medical model that really needs to be addressed and needs to be looked at in the current healthcare provider. So what is the evidence for mindfulness? As we've we've talked about, most of today's most common, costly chronic diseases are stress-related. And the evidence is clear that mindfulness decreases stress and distress while improving quality of life. It has strong influences on cardiovascular health, diabetes, musculoskeletal conditions, chronic pain, neurodegenerative diseases, HIV AIDS, coping with cancer, and somatization disorders. So when we pause, when we stop, when we meditate or notice the breath, if you will, what we're doing is this feedback loop right here. So when we sustain focus, we're using the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is the area of the brain that talks to the left prefrontal cortex and is our happiness center of the brain. So essentially it is an experiential mode. It is a way to connect to the present moment. I feel my feet on the ground. I feel my breath as an anchor and I know I'm safe. We continue to notice the breath until of course the mind wanders, which is absolutely normal. In that moment of mind wandering. We connect more to the right prefrontal cortex and connections to the amygdala, the posterior cingulate cortex. In the moment of mind wandering and bringing the mind back to the anchor of the breath, that is mindfulness by definition. It is distraction awareness. I've been gone. I've been making a list. I've been in thinking mode, planning mode, distraction mode busy brain mode, whatever you want to call it. And now I'm back and I'm feeling this inhale and this exhale. This is the insula cortex, the area of self-assessment, accurate self-assessment. And we know it illuminates when people are fully present. We've put meditators, long-time meditators and functional MRI scanners. And this is the area of the brain that strengthens. And that's what we want, right? We want to be able to assess situations for ourselves in a way that comes from an area, a way of strength rather than a fear-based or emotionally laden response. And then of course we reorient the awareness and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, talks to the interior parietal lobe and the circle continues. So when we tap into the body, so the sensation, the breath, we disconnect from that re- right prefrontal cortex. The somatosensory cortex is activated and the beta waves, the thinking waves uh, of the brain are dampened. So there's this functional shift to the left side of the brain, left prefrontal cortex, happiness center, and therefore our executive functioning centers. So that's the, um, the oversimplistic and um, brief version. Psychologically informed care is another area closely linked to mindfulness practices. And this is something that Joe does really well in terms of um, his research and his study focus. So when we teach or educate our patients or our students or our loved ones from a psychologically informed place, we know that the stress reactivity can either be dampened sympathetic nervous system flooding, heightened response to pain, or we can dampen it through parasympathetic vagus nerve activity. And we can tell people all day long what to do. We know what to do, but the key is to really practice with that five to eight minutes per day, like priming the pump, 
from a psychologically informed place or a trauma informed perspective, I often tell students and, and colleagues that I have difficulty sitting in meditation. So for me, I tend to prefer a yoga practice, uh, a nice hot and sweaty one uh, with a lot of flow and a lot of um, holding poses. I have to kind of activate the negative energy that was intended for, for threat and anxiety and worry. I have to get rid of it. And then at the end, I can meditate or do a body scan much more successfully. And that's kind of what we're doing when we're taking on this psychologically informed approach. We're inviting our patients to use strategies that work for them. Maybe it's breathing, maybe it's movement. And then we're inviting them to, to respond more holistically to our interventions. I'd like to end with a little story. And this is, um, I've been teaching students this content for almost 13 years now. And no, it's not very accepted by other faculty, um, especially by the scientific faculty. They really need to hear the neuroscience, which is fine. But this story was one that stayed with me for a very long time. I had a, a third year student who's about to go out on clinical. And each summer I do a small mindfulness certificate program. So students in their own time, this is not credit bearing, meet on a regular basis. They do uh, sort of an, an MBSR training and I lead them through learning how to meditate, learning how to do body scans and just learning how to notice the contents of their mind. And so the student had some struggles with self-worth. She was a family from immigrants. And in terms of the sort of the way she was raised was to be successful and to, you know, keep going, keep striving, be hard on yourself. Sound familiar? So she um, set up this, these very inflexible standards and had these, these biases and these performance requirements for herself. And when she would fall short, she would fall into this negative cycle. And as we know, this is rumination, maladaptive perfectionism. Perfectionism can be self-oriented, it can be other-oriented, and it can be society-driven. But it is um, typically about doing the being right about whatever it is you're doing. So the right job, the right partner, the right body, the right clothes, okay? And sometimes with that kind of rigidity, it's, it was hard for her to get out of bed. Her grades started to fall. She started to question whether or not she should be a physical therapist. And she went through this training with me. And I said, let's call her Sue. Sue, you need to let yourself feel. Shutting down any sadness or even you know worry, anxiety doesn't bring you closer to... Uh, being perfect or good. Being spiritual doesn't mean smiling through gritted teeth. Uh, you are already good. You don't have to tolerate other people potentially treating you unkindly, treating yourself unkindly. It doesn't mean that you need to ignore any sadness or refuse to get the help you need from a counselor. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you are allowed to shout when you're angry. You're allowed to curse when you're angry. You can hurt and cry and be pissed off and still be love and light and be a kind human and keep shining that light and moving forward. The trick is to feel those things honestly and deeply and then fill your own cup so that then you can fill the cup of others around you. So she came back to me after her final clinical. And she basically said, not only did I really find myself in this clinical, I found my passion. My patients gave me really high patient satisfaction scores. I felt really like I had made a difference. And my clinical instructors asked me at the end, what is it that has made you such a, a peaceful, effective, and, and grounded presence for your patients. And then of course they asked her to do um, a final presentation on mindfulness theory and practice. So she had really come full circle from years of self-doubt and being very hard on herself to this kind of feeling very capable and very confident. So if I can 
change one person's tra trajectory, one young person's trajectory, that makes all the difference for me. So thank you. And I'll take any questions now. Great. So we'll go to questions. Um, we're going to stop the, the sharing there if you can, Annette, so we can go to questions. I just have a couple of comments that came in through the chat thread that I you know, wanted to share with you as we're here talking. And so a couple of things through the chat thread as you're talking, first of all, your slides are just so beautiful. And I know just from teaching, it's hard to make slides like that. So the slides are just so beautiful to look at. Um, it's kind of like watching a, a, a nice movie. Um, so just comments coming in. People said, yes, we need to treat both the mind and the body more in healthcare and specifically PT, bringing those things together. Um, someone said, I too noticed that when I use mindfulness with my patients, they seem more satisfied and happy with their care. Someone said compassion, a focus on compassion is so important, especially since so many of our patients have uh, pre-existing histories of trauma, both those with chronic pain as, as well as people in women's health. Um, mm -hmm. And then someone thanked you for bringing the concept of social justice and mindfulness into PT, which I think is so important in light of what's happened the last couple of years in the US and globally with the yeah. Me Too movement and other, you know, Black Lives Matter, other movements that we're seeing around social justice, justice issues and how mindfulness and compassion obviously help support those types of, of missions. And as a PT, like we're seeing those people in our clinic, obviously. So Absolutely. that sensitivity aspect of it. A couple of questions also came in around kind of more like the, you know, kind of sticks and stones and things like that. So scope of practice as a physical therapist, I'm aware of psychologically informed practice. How does mindfulness fit into psychologically informed care? Well, I think it is, um, is really closely linked. Uh, I don't think you can have one without the other. So we as the healthcare practitioner, we need to be mindful of our own states uh, as we approach the patient. Uh, did we have an argument with our partner this morning? Uh, were the kids late for school? You know, it, what's going on in our own lives? What is that shadow side? You know, I often talk to my students about, you know, we, we approach you know, Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith, like with this, we've got this valence, we've got this bias and that's absolutely normal. So we need to be very self-aware and then we need to potentially, as I've said, prime the pump. So potentially uh, Mr. or Mrs. Smith can benefit more from uh, that psychologically informed approach. So can we invite them to uh, adopt a three minute breathing space? Can I have them place their hand on their chest so that they can actually feel the breath, stay connected to the breath and learn a little bit about the neuroscience and that axis that connects the brain and the body. People like to think, they like to be in cognitive mode. They like to live from here up. Uh, it makes them feel in control. It makes them feel confident. And they basically checked out of everything else going on from here down. Our work really is to get people to trust their bodies again. Mm -hmm. And I think universally, if we're in a healthcare profession, that is the, the key ingredient. And when we trust our bodies, we can listen to our bodies and then we can challenge the chatter in the mind, right? We can challenge whether or not the, the mind is um, being truthful, is being accurate, Sometimes the, the mind is emotionally valenced. So I tell my, my students and, and colleagues all the time, it's not the, the emotion that fuels the thought. It's the thought that fuels the emotion. And that's a huge aha moment for patients, clients, um, families, students. I'm like, sure you have something to, to add to that as well, Joe. Well, I, I think what I hear you saying is, you know, we've had this wave of psychologically informed practice that's come into PT. Super important. We need that. That obviously has to stay here. But also realizing that when you work with the body, which is what we do as PTs, um, mindfulness works with both the body as well as the mind. So you're starting to put those two together where sometimes people come into like psychologically informed practice where they're using traditional CBT and they're not quite sure how to take those skills and plug them into their practice. But when we're working with mind body type techniques, like you're teaching in mindfulness, that's second nature to us, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is, is great, but mindfulness takes it into the body. Mindfulness takes it that one step further. And I think 
That's what's so critical as, as hands-on helping professionals. Right. Training that interoceptive system is so important. Absolutely. It's, yes. You know, the, the mix of, you know, as PTs naturally, we're tapping into the somatic system. Yes. We're tapping into the autonomic nervous system. Those are really important with regard to, you know, recovery and care. Always a question about billing. I obviously we go, we know you guys are out there and you're seeing patients and you have to bill for it. As Annette mentioned, you know, you are working with the body and you are retraining the nervous system. So neuromuscular reeducation, which is 97112, you can use patient education, which is 97530. Both of those are time codes. They're about 15 minutes each. So you can work this into a nice 30 minute treatment session. Both, you know, Annette and I are, are um, advocates for, there may be times, and Annette already mentioned this, where you may put exercise to the side just for a visit or two and work on more of those mindfulness skills. And once they have those skills, then continue on with your therapeutic exercise program and things like that. So you can fit this in as just a single intervention where you're just doing mindfulness. I do a lot of that in my practice now, but of course, eventually you mix this together with Therex and manual therapy. So it becomes a, a multimodal um, intervention. People. So there's a, another question that came in uh, kind of along the lines of psychologically informed care. Can I work, can I use this or can I, can I work with patients who have um, mental health challenges like anxiety and depression. Mm, absolutely. I think this is um, key in, in working with um, clients with mental health challenges. Um, as I said, from a trauma informed perspective, you may, instead of inviting that person to begin meditation right off the bat, and, and here's a great app, um, you might invite that person to just walk mindfully or uh, move mindfully some really gentle yoga stretches more mindfully so that they can begin to trust their bodies and then start to examine that the negative core processes and negative valence of the mind. But absolutely, I think it's not only our, our role, I think it's, it's a requirement for today's patient. So I think everyone to some extent has some worry has some, we call them big T traumas or little T traumas. We're human beings with a history. And uh, what we have experienced in our past, we know lives in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way to approach that is from this, this mindful approach of addressing the, the somatic first. Great. And then uh, there's a question from someone who understands, obviously, that she can start using this in her practice with, with patients. So in her PT practice, she's an ortho PT. She also has a side hustle on the side where she works in a gym. Where are the, what are the other opportunities to work mindfulness into either um, different areas of PT practice or, and kind of outside into the community space? Oh, my gosh. I think the opportunities are endless. So um, I, I think in your place of work, I think opening a, a meeting with a three minute breathing space is wonderful. So, you know, either, either you play music or you just take a moment of silence. Um, if pre people prefer not to participate, they don't have to. I think that you can do that in your place of work. Uh, certainly you can use this in the gym. I'm a yoga teacher myself and I sneak meditation into some of the holding poses. And I, my job, I tell my yogis is to keep you in your body and out of your brain. So I think that uh, across the board, if we have this intention to learn more and read a, a little bit about mindfulness every day to, you know, get a feed into your email inbox from some of the latest, greatest literature on mindfulness and uh, trauma informed care. I think that it can be a really easy transition for us as clinicians to then say, Hey, you know, to our patients, I read this study this morning, you know, I, I read this abstract. Uh, it really does take about a minute or two and yourself as, as a practitioner, the more you yourself practice taking a three minute breathing space. One of my favorite apps is simple habit or insight timer or um, headspace. My students love those apps because it's that, regular reminder. Sometimes they forget in the morning or throughout the day, but they definitely do it before bed because it helps them sleep. It helps quiet the mind so that the mind becomes the snow globe. And at the end of the day, they don't know how to shut it down. So I think we can take this work um, with our own practice and the things that we learn to those around us for sure. 
It's a great point. I, I always try to squeeze in at least five minutes in the morning just to kind of like center myself before the day starts. When I was younger, I would just, you know, fly out of bed and have a cup of coffee and like your body is physically running as well as your mind is running. No longer do I do that. And as you mentioned, I think in the evening, sleep is just so critical for health. Absolutely. And mindfulness, the, so the research on mindfulness and sleep is, is fascinating to read. It is. Yeah. yeah. The research on mindfulness and um, obesity is fascinating. If we turn off the TV and uh, consume a meal, if we taste our meal, if you know we share a meal, if we wonder as we're eating, where did this meal come from? All those sorts of things can help us. Notice we're full. Notice that we're not tasting our food. Uh, so I think it's it's connected to just about everything we do. As I said, there's a study on mindfully washing the dishes, which is one of my favorite studies to share. Can you <laughs> so feel the point, bubbles? Can, can you feel the soap? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'd like to invite all of you to join uh, Professor Wilgins in a course we have created for you. It's a six-hour um, CEU training. It's called Mindful Stress Management for the Healthcare Professional. Um, I think you kind of get a sense from the presentation today that you'll learn techniques and interventions for yourself and your own personal health, as well as for use, obviously, in the clinic setting with your patients, no matter what type of setting that you're working in. Um, it is a six-week course. Five of those modules are virtual online, so you can go through those at your own pace. They're pre-recorded. And then in week six, there's going to be a live 90-minute a mentor and coaching session, which Annette is obviously going to lead as in the first five weeks there. So week one is foundations of mindfulness. Week two is the neuroscience behind mindfulness. Week three are everyday applications for mindfulness. Week four is uh, addressing the messy moments mindfully, which she mentioned. I love that kind of metaphor. And week five are triggers and building resilience around that really important ACEs and trauma informed care and emotional triggers um, that we all are seeing in practice. So Again, it's six weeks total. The first five weeks are virtual, um, pre-recorded, so you can go through that on your own. It is approved for CEs and CEUs for um, PTs, OTs, health coaches, and psychologists and other mental health professionals. I have seen the back end of the program, as you can tell from Annette's slides. Um, the slides are beautiful. Her content is incredible. And she also includes guided practice, which I think is really important. When you're training in mindfulness, this is an experiential type practice, so you have to experience it, Right. We can talk about mindfulness a, a lot, but we have to experience it in our own mind, in our own body. And each week there's guided practice, different types of guided practice that she brings you through. Of course, with, with all the programs at the Institute, once you purchase the course, it's yours. You can um, go through it at your own pace. We would love, of course, that you join us for week six, but you can come back to this content over and over and over. You can download all the content all the handouts so you can use it in your practice with your patients. And as we mentioned, developing your own um, mindfulness interventions, either in the clinic or outside in the community, there's so many community applications um, for mindfulness with regard to stress management and, and the management of management, the promotion of, of health that we're seeing as PTs. So there's, there should be a link here for you. you can click the link below and you can join it now. It's an incredible course. It complements so many other of the courses that we have here at the Institute, but it's very different and distinct in its own uh, right, because um, Annette's focus really is on the stress reduction aspect of it, which is so important. A lot of things that I've taught have been more on the kind of cognitive aspect. As Annette mentioned, getting into our body, working on stress, working on the interoceptive network, the somatic system, a lot of that is really wrapped up into this course. And you can use that, obviously, in PT practice. Um, anything you want to add there, Annette, before we wrap up? No, I, I think I'd like to just emphasize that there, there will be some practices. And I think that, uh, as Joe said, to feel it in your own body is really important. And I will invite you to develop a, a habit of, uh, of a regular practice. Um, there's a practice log that you can use if you wish. Uh, you certainly don't have to, but I think that, uh, that that might be really fun and does make the course unique. Great. So once again, it, this is a CE activity, CE slash CEU activity, uh, mindful stress management for the health professional. It's six weeks long. The first five weeks are pre-recorded. Week six is that live mentorship and coaching call. If you can't make the coaching call, that's okay. We do record it and we place it in the program so you can access it at a later time. We would love to see you there live in person. I will be there. Um, but if you can't make it there, that's okay. 
we will pre-record it for you so you can um, go back to it and see it anytime again. Uh, we invite you to join us. Um, both Annette and I are, are um, really trying to bring awareness to mindfulness and PT practice, but of course, just chronic pain and health promotion in general. So I appreciate her being my partner in crime in this. It's really important information, especially when you're working with people with chronic pain, trauma, uh, all the things that we're really seeing in PT practice. So thank you all for joining us and being here with us today. And I want to thank Annette for joining us and sharing the information. And we'll see you all in, in the program. Thank you, Joe. And if you have any further questions, you can email us, of course, um, our email address is support at integrative pain science institute.com. That's support at integrative pain science institute.com. Okay, everyone, have a great day. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrative pain science institute.com. That's integrative pain science institute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.